wonderful. Um, so to stick to timekeeping, I'm not going to talk too much, but please, for this initial part, keep yourself muted, um, and then there'll be plenty of time to unmute yourselves and participate in the Q&A later. So I'll hand it off to Dr. Sylvia Baer now. Thanks. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I should say the real project leader was actually in Tisara Gerici, so I don't want to take uh, <laughs> the um, claim the uh, lawyers for that. Uh, and um, yes, we said we would start on time. We, we didn't, but never mind. Uh, hopefully the rest of the program will be on track. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased to be uh, yeah, chairing this uh, meeting and introducing the topic, um, after which uh, we will have Dr. Hatem Kahun, who is a professor of urban studies at the University of Cartag. Uh, presenting the quantitative findings for us, and um, I think he will present in Arabic, um, but the slides are in English, so uh, you can use the channels um, to um, listen to the English um, translation, and I want to already at this point thank our translators for the job they're doing today. Um, and then we have Intisar um, Harichi uh, presenting the qualitative findings. Uh, it's basically a draft report, so we would like to highlight that these are really preliminary findings uh, of a project that, um, yeah, I will tell you a little bit about in a minute. And then we're very pleased to have um, uh, Dr. Marcus Leuve from the German Institute of Development and Sustainability, German Institute of Development and Sustainability, IDOS, yes, uh, who is a real expert on the social contracts in the MENA region, uh, to uh, comment on our findings, as well as Professor Ellen Last, who is the founder and director of the uh, global, um, sorry, the Governance and Local Development Institute uh, at Gothenburg University in Sweden, who is also an expert uh, on anything uh, related to governance in the Middle East and political development. So we really um, pleased to have you with us. And of course, we will open it up to Q&A and uh, the aim is to finish uh, on time. So we can, yeah, go to the next um, slide. Um, uh, which is just a short um, introduction to the social contract. And I borrowed this actually from Marcus's uh, um, earlier publication um, because I felt that it was um, summarizing, visualizing very well sort of what, what is the social contract, you know, it's between the state and the society and, and these three Ps as they call them, protection, provision and participation. I find a useful uh, sort of framework, what is the state, you know, sort of it says that the society should recognize the government as legitimate and um yeah and maybe pay taxes and, and fulfill other obligations if if in, in, in turn the government um satisfies the expectations of citizens in terms of delivering this protection which uh, yeah is security uh, rule of law uh provision of certain yeah services um infrastructures and also granting some participation um, so yeah, that's uh, just to sort of all of us being a little bit on the same um, uh, level in terms of or the same perspective that we're using in this research on the social contract. And we are very happy to hear your critiques of this and uh, your nuancing of this. And hopefully we'll do some of this already in our presentations as well. Um, the next slide. Um, uh, and also maybe I should say about the social contract, what I wanted to say is also that um, that there are um, that social contracts are not nationally the same, that in a territory they can uh, they, they, you can have maybe several or a multiple a plurality of social contracts, and that's what we wanted to find out in this project. And so we're very grateful to the Knowledge Management Fund of the Knowledge, Knowledge Platform Security and Rule of Law, who funded this project. We responded to um, a call for proposals um, last year, which was called Reimagining Social Contracts. And you can see here what, uh, what the aim of this uh, particular semantic headline was. Again, this plurality of social contracts was already acknowledged. Um, and yeah, um, to be honest, the reimagination part in Tunisia is very difficult at the moment. So <laughs> we're not sure that we are doing that well on that front, but, um, um, but you know, um, yeah, I think we still, we, we try to, um, in the research, try to at least uh, um, find, so let's say, pockets of uh, <laughs> success where, where the such social contracts can actually, um, yeah, be found uh, where, where people do accept and recognize legitimacy of the state and what are the conditions that need to be in place for that, especially when it comes to um, trust building. Um, the next slide, I think we'll talk about, um, yeah, our um, projects in uh, particular and, um, yeah, what were the objectives? Um, yeah, of course, responding to the call, um, we wanted to understand citizen experiences sort of a little bit from the bottom up and we, and NTSR will present, especially the qualitative findings. Um, yeah, there's some quotes where you can 
uh, where we can see some of this, uh, but of course also in the data set that we used, um, which um, Professor Hartem uh, has analyzed, uh, that was also quite granular and um, in, in different, you know, at the municipal level. Um, and then, yeah, developing strategies for reframing these relations. Um, and there we, we found two um, projects that um, served as case studies, which uh, Inti will, will present, um, where we, yeah, we identified a number of factors where actually such trust building um, uh, happened. Uh, and then, yeah, the imagination, as I said, it was a struggle in the current uh, climate in, in Tunisia, but and also we had to reframe our initial aim of, of or revise our initial aim or ambitions to link decentralization reforms and security sector reforms and to really involve the stakeholders in these, sec in these sectors, simply because it turned out to be, of course, a very sensitive and difficult um, topic to approach. Um, and for our well, the researchers' uh, safety um, and of that of the participants, uh, we obviously could not use uh, the word uh, well, these words uh, too too explicitly, and so we. That's why the our webinar is more about um, uh, local public administration reform. Um, yeah, I think uh, then I can have a next slide on. Um, it's a bit full, I'm afraid. I apologize in advance, but just to get very quickly an idea of the methodology. Um, as I said, we we had a very rich data set. Also, I think it was collected with with the GLD. Um, uh, um, yeah, the GLD uh, Institute was also involved in this, and, and maybe Ellen actually can tell us more about that as well in her in her um, um, discussion. Um, yeah, so twenty municipalities across Tunisia. Um, then we we produced a desk research um, where especially we mapped all those initiatives involving this kind of reform that I talked about. Um, and there were quite a few uh, because, of course, Tunisia seems to be a, a donor darling and uh, all the donors are very much involved in, in this, especially because it looked like such a hopeful um, case after the revolution in 2010-11. Um, as I said, we focused on two specific projects and we'll explain, well, we, we selected them uh, um, according to certain criteria. Um, and um, then we conducted semi-structured interviews. I mean, this is all the work of the Jasmine Foundation. Um, um, uh, yeah, uh, with, so I, they did a really great job in, in, uh, introduce, in, in getting these interviews organized and also focus group discussions. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, the challenge I think is, is obvious. So I think that's all I had to say. Um, uh, and yeah, as I said, this, these are preliminary findings that we will present, and we are very happy for any feedback you can give us and any yeah uh, any inspiring ideas on how to uh, how to frame maybe our findings as well. Um, yeah, I think I'll we can now move to um, okay. I think Hatem has not arrived yet. I just see it in the chat. So he did have another commitment, uh, PhD defense up until the hour. So. So then in that case, I think I'll head, hand over to um, NTSAR um, to continue with the qualitative part first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for uh, the great introduction. Uh, also, just to clarify that anyone, uh, I'll say it in Arabic, تحت وين موجود interpretation تختار اللغة المكتوبة French الفرنسية للأسف زوم مش موجود فيه الأوبسيون تاع العربية فهو احنا القناة الفرنسية هي on fait بالعربية اللي يحب يتبع باللغة العربية ثم ترجمة موجودة so uh, just to uh, continue uh, so Sylvia very kindly set out the, the overall methodology, and my part will be to uh, present the qualitative, the results of the qualitative uh, data collection that we did, uh, which, as she mentioned, was focused on, uh, first of all, scoping interviews and then uh, case study selection. So we chose eight different uh, localities in Tunisia to study further, um, and then followed by interviews and uh, focus group discussions and a little bit of participant observation as well in the where we could find actually uh, specific events that we could participate in. 
Um, so, uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you also for attending some familiar faces and some uh, new faces and names as well. Um, in terms of how I'm going to uh, to structure my presentation, I'll give a very quick overview. Since we are talking about um, social contracts, we're framing this study within the understanding of how to, um, in fact, how to reshape the and reimagine the social contract in Tunisia. I'll start with a brief overview of how the social contract in Tunisia has evolved over the last few decades, and then I'll move on to explaining our uh, research findings and our case studies. Um, and just to explain, as Sylvia mentioned, that there have been a lot of challenges, I would say, and constraints in terms of the research. Uh, so in the beginning, we had wanted to focus more on um, uh, the security uh, part of the social contract uh, and protection, but it proved to be a bit uh, challenging in the current political context in Tunisia. Um, so we decided to broaden actually our focus to look more at public administration reform more generally. Um, and also, uh, during the research, we did face constraints, uh, and actually, uh, we had to uh, change the, the format and change some of the uh, dissemination events, so I can see that some of the research participants are in the, in the Zoom. We had hoped to have uh, several workshops inside Tunisia, uh, physically, to uh, share and discuss the findings with research participants, um, and to actually have more of a kind of uh, creative uh, sessions to reimagine the social contract, how it can be rebuilt from the local level up. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the political situation and uh, some of the risks to the researchers who actually face some uh, direct um, uh, harassment from police, we were uh, unable to do that. So we've switched to this online webinar. Uh, but in any case, I hope it's going to be a fruitful discussion with all of you here. So let me start with a breakdown of the social contract just to uh, look uh, a quick historical overview of the, his, the social contract in Tunisia, starting in 1956 independence. Um, I think more or less um, everyone is familiar with the, the, the demands and the aspirations that were expressed during uh, the 2010 and 11 uprising in Tunisia. Um, and this very much uh, articulated demands to uh, revise the relationship between the state and citizens. Uh, focusing specifically, as Sylvia mentioned, on two elements of the social contract, looking at better provision of uh, material goods, public goods, such as infrastructure, public services, and job opportunities, but also participation uh, in decision making and expression, freedom of expression. Um, but these demands were articulated against the background of uh, a not too distant memory when the social contract in Tunisia was more inclusive. And so uh, in the immediate uh, period after 1956, the independence in 1956, uh, this is uh, often remembered as a golden age in terms of the social contract in some ways in Tunisia, uh, because the building of a, a post-independence state saw a massive expansion of the public administration, uh, of public services, uh, of public jobs, uh, etc. And so this period uh, actually is... Um, formative in the memories of many Tunisians, older Tunisians, who remember a time when the Tunisian welfare state was much more generous uh, and when opportunities in the public sector were much uh, uh, more numerous uh, and when education, healthcare and infrastructure was uh, being expanded at a, at a massive rate. Uh, and so the social contract at that time was essentially providing public goods for citizens, for citizens in exchange for political, their political uh, quiescence um, and so uh, at that time, that was uh, the social contract that was in place. We see this begun, begin to change uh, towards the 1970s as the Tunisian economy experienced more significant difficulties. And so we see here uh, the start of liberalization reforms, uh, which uh, to some extent scaled back the state's intervention, particularly in interior regions. Uh, so before that, the state had been much more present in trying to create a kind of balance between different regions by creating industries in interior regions. Uh, but you can see in the map here uh, that actually uh, interior regions by 2010, there was a vast gap in, in the poverty rate and the access to infrastructure, to basic services between interior regions uh, on the left and the coastal regions, which you can see uh, on the top right. And then into the 1980s. Where is the but is on by now. Sorry, I think somebody needs to mute their mic. Um, and um, continuing into the 1980s, uh, end of 1980s, 2000 until the 2000s, we see more of a, a move towards privatization of state-owned firms. 
which essentially went hand in hand with growing corruption and nepotism um, as the opportunities provided by privatization uh, benefited largely those who are close to uh, the president and, and those in his close circle, um, and also together with a scaling back of the welfare state. So we see continued social spending, uh, but really a declining quality of public services. And this is also something that uh, remains in the, in the Tunisian memory, uh, that public schools, public health, etc., uh, were better and have been declining over a number of decades, and of course, growing regional disparities and youth unemployment. Uh, and so we see essentially um, the social contract beginning to, uh, to uh, disintegrate uh, and reaching its expiry essentially uh, by 2010. Uh, if we move on, briefly, I want to uh, talk a little bit about, a bit about the general a system through which the social contract has been administered in Tunisia, which can be or has been described as state corporatism uh, in the literature. Uh, and essentially, this is a system in which the state uh, dominates and organizes society uh, through specific representative bodies. Uh, so the ruling party played a, a very important role in administrating the social contract. Uh, by uh, distributing goods. So it was one of the essential uh, channels through which uh, access to public services, access to public sector jobs, access to, to credit, to finance uh, were mediated uh, and controlled. And so the ruling party played a very important role in the social contract, but also uh, national organizations uh, like uh, business uh, federations, labor unions, et cetera, who were essentially um, to some extent uh, uh, dominated by the state uh, and their role was rather to manage social tensions rather than to argue for a change of the social contract. If we move on in the slides and uh, this complicated diagram uh, draws on actually some previous research, uh, research that I have done. Um, you don't need to look at it too closely or get confused but really to summarize uh, how the system was able to function really was due to um, a, a high degree of centralization uh, at local level through the person of the regional governor, the Weli, um, and the local uh, representatives of the regional governor and the Ministry of Interior, who is the uh, delegate, the Matment. Uh, these are very important figures in uh, local governance and in the administering of the social contract at, at local level, uh, because essentially they bring together and they control all the public and private actors who are active at local level. Uh, so the regional governor, as you can see, uh, the Weli at the center of the, of the diagram uh, directly uh, reports to the presidency, also under the authority of the Ministry of Interior on the left, um, and directly oversees a number of different local administrations and local officials. And at the same time, these are very closely uh, integrated with the ruling party and also uh, national organizations. Uh, somebody can mute their mic. National organizations. So here I'm talking about uh, the, the employment, uh, the employers' federation, the trade unions, uh, women, national women's unions, national youth organizations, etc. So this is just to um, indicate how the social contract actually played out or was managed on the on a daily level through this kind of centralized system in which there were key uh, regional uh, officials who uh, coordinated. And, uh, and controlled uh, the local level very closely. If we move on, uh, briefly looking at how the social contract has uh, evolved since 2011. Uh, so since 2011, uh, the, the public administration uh, has continued to function, uh, but in a general climate of uncertainty, uh, particularly in light of a kind of outbreak of, um, of uh, public outrage and anger uh, against the symbols of state authority. So in the aftermath of um, 14th of January 2011, there were attacks on uh, local government buildings, ruling party uh, headquarters, et cetera, uh, which uh, created a kind of sen a climate of uncertainty for the public administration, uh, which continued to function, but uh, experienced many internal changes. Um, at the same time, Tunisia experienced a vast expansion of civic and political rights. So you can see uh, on the right there, there is a map of, um, of protests uh, that uh, took place uh, between, uh, I think, um, March and June 2020, so in the space of uh, three months. 
uh, and which uh, shows the, the, the sort of regional um, uh, coverage of protests around the country, which related to a number of different demands, an outpouring of demands relating to uh, the provision aspect of the social contract, so demanding employment, demanding public services, demanding infrastructure, and also at the same time, um, the participation element of the social contract. So, uh, so uh, freedom of expression, transparency, access to information, all of those issues. Um, and uh, we saw we see a number of issue based and uh, local social movements emerging around these different uh, issues. Uh, if we can move on. Uh, and so you can see here actually that uh, the the expansion of civic and political rights created new avenues for the, the authority of the state and the authority of public officials to be challenged. Um, so here the, the quote uh, talks about the fact that the state after 2011 could no longer just shut criticism down. And the fact that public sector employees, so bureaucrats, uh, were no longer um, no longer able to, uh, to impose simply their authority because of the fact that citizens could record a video, they could share things on social media, uh, issues, uh, misconduct could be reported in, in the mainstream media also. And so there were new avenues uh, to challenge public misconduct, even if accountability was not always uh, uh, attained. If we move on. So our research focused really on the local uh, public administration reform. So looking at how the local state was, uh, or how attempts were made to reform local um, authorities after 2011. Uh, I don't want to go too much into this, but it's in the report if you want to have a look more at the detail. Uh, so we looked at, uh, we did a desk review of all the different uh, public administration reform initiatives we could identify uh, and discerned uh, four main approaches to, um, to trying to reform the public administration, some of them looking at changing laws, some of them seeking to change the internal functioning of public administration, uh, a lot of them focusing on technology and digitization, uh, and many of them also focusing on training, so uh, training uh, public officials and, and integrating elements, uh, new norms such as human rights, uh, public uh, accountability, etc. Moving on. And so from these uh, different initiatives, we chose to focus on two projects, which are going to be the focus of the rest of my presentation. Uh, first of all, um, uh, the Espèce Citoyen, the Fada and Muatan project, uh, which is implemented uh, at municipal level by municipalities. And secondly, the Shortat al Jiwar, the uh, community policing project, uh, which was led by the Ministry of Interior. Um, and we chose to look at both of these projects because they had some very similar elements that made them comparable and also very interesting to, to examine. Uh, essentially, they both began from uh, the, the idea that uh, there was a crisis of trust uh, among citizens in terms of uh, municipalities and in terms of the police, uh, given that these local authorities, the municipalities and the police stations uh, faced uh, the largest number of attacks after uh, the, the revolution, and they were viewed as symbols essentially of the regime. Um, also, the fact that the two projects uh, draw on international models, so they look at comparative examples of community policing and, and uh, uh, city uh, citizen offices. At the same time, they were uh, redesigned nationally to fit the Tunisian context, and rolled out and adapted locally in different localities, which makes it very interesting to study how these projects uh, took different directions in different localities around Tunisia. And finally, they are actually designed in quite a similar way. They both build around uh, three key elements. The first one is the redesign of physical space. So uh, rebuilding government buildings in order to make them more citizen friendly and more accessible. Secondly, improving the quality of services provided to citizens. And thirdly, uh, improving dialogue and communication and opening ways for citizens to participate and to communicate uh, with uh, public officials. If we move on uh, briefly, the, I'll start with the community policing uh, project. Uh, and so uh, the community policing project explained uh, was uh, implemented by the Ministry of Interior, which is responsible for the, the police, uh, overseeing the police force in Tunisia. Um, and this project essentially uh, contained three elements, as I mentioned, rebuilding uh, police stations, local police stations, 
essentially by uh, dividing up administrative spaces away from areas in which uh, criminal suspects are, are dealt with to make it more uh, pleasant for, uh, for citizens who are coming in to do the administrative uh, procedures. Uh, also installing computers, uh, digitizing processes and introducing CCTV cameras. Uh, the second element was uh, training police officers in a sort of new philosophy and way of working, uh, which was um, intended to uh, promote human rights, promote uh, dialogue and promote um, a less uh, sort of hierarchical uh, mode of interaction with citizens. And finally, the third element, which is the most interesting uh, and which I'll focus on is uh, putting in place uh, a body called the Local Security Council. Uh, and these local security councils, Majelis Amin Mahali, or Majelis Mahali Al Amin, they actually, uh, as you can see at the bottom, there is a, a diagram. They were composed of four main uh, components, which are the delegate, who is the, the local representative of the Ministry of Interior, the mayor, who is the elected uh, mayor of the area the local police chief representing the police force in that area, and finally civil society, uh, whose role essentially is really to represent local residents, to mobilize them, to engage them, to, to attend uh, the activities of the local security council, uh, to discuss local issues, and to um, actually deliver local campaigns as well on specific topics uh, that are selected as priorities. So this is the functioning of the local security council. If we move on to the next slide. So we uh, selected four localities uh, based on our uh, scoping interviews, four localities uh, which we uh, thought were uh, comparable in terms of their geographic and socioeconomic profiles. And we tried to understand how the Police de Proximité uh, project actually uh, uh, was able to create dialogue between citizens and police, and what were the factors that enable dialogue to be created uh, and thus trust to be built between the citizens and police, uh, and which factors uh, represented an obstacle to building dialogue between citizens and police. What we found overall is that uh, the, the Police de Proximité uh, project and the local security councils were effective in creating spaces for dialogue between citizens and the police. Even though uh, the, the the historical um, uh, you know the history of tense relations between police and citizens because of the long history of police repression impacted uh, the way that citizens engaged in this uh, in this initiative, even though there was a lot of skepticism in the beginning about uh, something called a local security council where citizens go and talk to the police and sit with them and talk about local issues. Uh, and of course, there was a skepticism also of uh, being seen to be police informants for those who actually participate. Nevertheless, despite this, what we found across the different, uh, the four localities was that, was that the councils actually did open up opportunities for citizens and the police to exchange views uh, on, on local issues that are affecting the local community in ways that uh, often manage to go beyond the habitual patterns of, of hostile relations between citizen and the police. So here you can see a quote uh, by one of the uh, research participants explaining how their perceptions actually changed during the, the, their participation in the project. Uh, they saw that there were people in the police who actually wanted to change the way that things were done, how they dealt with citizens. Uh, they were able to, uh, to, to discuss together, to do activities together. Uh, and this helped to remove some of the negative perceptions uh, held by citizens and police of each other. So essentially local councils do create an opportunity for dialogue. And we try to understand where local security councils were most effective in actually building trust between uh, citizens and the police. And the first factor we were able to identify was the active engagement of senior police officials who were able to draw on their credibility within the local community uh, to engage citizens. Uh, this is perhaps not surprising. Most public administration reform initiatives um, uh, you know, emphasize the need for senior leadership within uh, these public institutions to be very actively engaged. Uh, and so uh, what was uh, highlighted was that uh, the, the visible presence of senior leadership was very important. Uh, so you can see here, for example, a quote uh, by one of the uh, civil society activists who sat on one of the councils saying that um, 
the fact that uh, the first person in the room when they would have these council meetings was the regional head of security, who would then proceed to basically call, ring around the, the, the police force and make sure that everyone attended uh, from the highest to the lowest ranks, and how this really signaled commitment uh, from the police towards the local community to, uh, to give value to uh, citizen participation, to the views of citizens, um, and to, to change the relationship between the police and citizens. So that's the first factor. If we go back just one slide, the second factor we identified is that having commitment by senior public officials is not enough. At the same time, they also need to be supported visibly uh, by the institutions in which they uh, uh, work and which they represent. Uh, so what we found is that uh, at times, um, reform-minded, we can call them uh, police chiefs, were able to build trust at the local level, the citizens, uh, but at the same time, uh, when the Ministry of Interior or when higher police officials did not demonstrate a similar commitment to change relations, whether it's, for example, it is due to police brutality, which goes unaddressed, um, cases, instances of immune, impunity of police who, uh, who, uh, who misbehave or, or uh, engage in misconduct or brutality, when these things happen and there is no adequate response from the structure, from the institution of the police and of the Ministry of Interior, this actually undermines the, the trust that is built in the local police chiefs. So it's not sufficient that local police chiefs participate, but actually the institutions themselves need to demonstrate commitment to changing their practices more widely. Otherwise, the whole project loses credibility. And we were we highlight in the report several examples where actually uh, trust had been built, civil society participated in the project, they, act, they put their uh, own credibility on the line in many ways in order to engage their local communities, but then when there were instances of police mistreatment or brutality and nothing was done, uh, this actually undermined the entire um, belief in the project and reinforced the existing um, skepticism of the inability of the ability of the police to change as an institution. And you can see here, for example, a quote uh, which talks about a specific incident in one of the areas, uh, Sidi Hassin, which uh, is known for a particularly tense relationship between police and, uh, and uh, citizens, where essentially a, 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 an incident of police brutality happened locally. And instead of addressing the key causes, uh, and the, the those who are responsible for it, the Ministry of Interior simply fired the head of the police, the local police, uh, which actually undermined uh, the, the trust that had been built because people understood that the police is not interested in actually dealing with the structural issues. They are simply looking for a scapegoat, even though the local police chief was actually someone who was seen to be very reformist and reform-minded. Moving to the next slide. And finally, the third factor in, in building trust between police and citizens was the ability of key individuals locally uh, to mobilize uh, others in their local community around the concept of uh, community policing, of engaging with the police, and also having behind them um, strong, credible organizations who were able to actually mobilize people. Uh, and so we found that in, in uh, various uh, localities, um, key individuals played a very important role in developing a discourse, uh, developing a discourse, uh, a simplistic, perhaps a simplified discourse uh, rather, in order to explain to citizens why they should give the police a chance, why they should engage in dialogue, why not all essentially all police officers are bad or simplifying the, 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 um, the process of change how uh, uh, change will take time, but how it can be built gradually. And so uh, these uh, individuals were, uh, were effective in essentially becoming uh, mediators between the police and local residents. And even when crises occurred, they were able to actually uh, change their discourse or adapt their discourse in order not to, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, allow the project to stop, but essentially to try to continue uh, to, to build trust and to overcome uh, crises. And we saw actually in the, the report, we highlight some really interesting examples of how uh, local security councils became um, bodies for um, mediating and for, uh, for uh, preventing the escalation of conflict. Even for example, in Birgeden in on the uh, border with Libya, um, 
uh, you know, the council members became important mediators between the police and citizens. They managed crises where there were hundreds of citizens, for example, who were stuck on the border, and they opened up channels for communicating, for example, with civil society in Libya and civil society in Tunisia, and also opening up channels uh, for reducing tensions uh, with the police. So those uh, examples are given in a bit more detail in our report. If we move on, and I'll try to uh, um, summarize very quickly here, move on to the Espace Citoyen. What we find essentially is that uh, the, the community policing model does provide a space for being able to open up a dialogue between police and, and citizens, even a dialogue that does address structural issues in terms of police brutality. At the same time, what we found is that it suffered from certain weaknesses that undermined its ability to, to maintain a sustained dialogue. And we can see some of the councils, many of them have, um, have become defunct, uh, not so active. Some uh, the dialogue initiatives have uh, largely uh, stopped. And uh, some of these weaknesses we highlight in our report that essentially it's not really clear who sets the terms of the dialogue within these councils. If you look closely, uh, the space, the terms of the dialogue still continue to be very much controlled by the, the police. Uh, by the delegate, for example, the local delegate who chairs these uh, local security councils. We go into the reasons in the report, which is that the way that the, the local priorities are selected is not clear, that actually these councils have limited mandates to discuss more systemic issues around police citizen relations, <clears throat> and also that they have no legal status as bodies. They don't exist as a legal entity, and so they remain reliant on, on other on state administrations to help them, to provide them with resources, to enable them to, to, to be active. And so all of these things undermine, unfortunately, the, the ability of these um, councils to actually continue to develop this dialogue into something that can have a wider systemic uh, impact. Um, and also, uh, finally, we raise the question of how far uh, mere participation and dialogue can really help to reshape the relationship between police and state, uh, where the wider questions of systemic, um, for example, uh, police brutality remain unaddressed uh, within these bodies. Let's move uh, to the next slide. So those are our findings for the community policing project. Uh, I will try to be quicker with the next, the, the, the second and final project we looked at, which is the uh, Espace Citoyen project, the Fada al Muatan. Uh, and this project, uh, rather than uh, being uh, related to the police, this is a project that concerned primarily municipalities, uh, so the local government um, in Tunisia. Uh, as mentioned before, there are various elements within the project that made it interesting to compare to the community policing project in the sense that it also involved um, attempts to rebuild the relationship between state and citizens by changing the physical space in which in that interaction happens, so improving the quality of services that are provided to citizens, and also focusing very much on the element of communication and dialogue with citizens. As you can see in the diagram here, essentially how the Espace Citoyen project uh, functions, and this is a very short and incomplete description because it's a very complicated project, but essentially, uh, whereas in the past, members of the public used to essentially go to different departments within the municipality to uh, submit their requests for certain permits and, and permissions and uh, papers, uh, the Espace Citoyen project creates a front office, a single front office, which is the vis-a-vis -vis for the citizens. Uh, they go there where they submit their requests, they understand what are the papers required, etc. And then it is the, the, the front office which then manages uh, the communication with the technical departments who, who do the actual work of preparing and reviewing the, the, the applications. Uh, and so uh, what it does is it uh, narrows down the number of um, municipal officials that citizens engage with. Rather than dealing with three or four people, perhaps going to various offices, they deal simply with uh, the front office, which is headed by uh, one person, the, the, the head of the Espace Citoyen, and then it's staffed by various public agents who, who uh, help the citizens to uh, submit their requests and receive their responses. And so here also we studied four citizen offices, two in Tunis and two in uh, Midnin in the, in the south. I will summarize very quickly. Similarly to what we did with the uh, community policing project, we also tried to identify what were the factors that enabled the Espace Citoyen to succeed in terms of 
um, putting in place new forms of communication uh, with citizens and improving the relationship between state and citizens. If we move to the next slide. Here also we have, uh, we highlighted three factors. The first factor that was important in the success of these Espèce Citoyen uh, was the presence again of senior leadership who are who are committed to making the new system work. Uh, and here we're talking uh, about both elected officials, so the mayor, and also unelected officials, so the, the secretary general, specifically of the, of the municipality, who was the most senior bureaucrat. And uh, here, uh, we also uh, get into issues of um, politics within the municipal council. Um, so for those of you who know sort of the municipal uh, context in Tunisia, you would know that uh, municipal councils are a very, um, very diverse set of different parties and independent lists. And so the mayor has to put together a majority in order to become the mayor. Um, and sometimes you have very fragmented councils which make it difficult to have stability uh, and also enable the mayor to, to sort of get on with, the, with their work. Um, and so what we found is that um, even where you had uh, a strong will from the mayor to make the, the, the project succeed, uh, in fact, there were situations where uh, he or she was not able to actually really address and, and, and um, make progress on this uh, on the uh, system that was put in place because of conflicts within the municipal council. And so it shows that the ability of, of senior leadership to, to resolve conflicts requires also having uh, some uh, form of uh, stability within the municipal council, which raises the question of how you can uh, have a balance between the pluralism that's represented in uh, municipal councils through the elections, but at the same time having some uh, stability that allows actually municipal uh, administrations to work. Uh, and also, uh, just to highlight here that also it was important for the mayor to have a really good working relationship with the secretary general, we found, uh, and for them to be able to make the project succeed by working together which also raises the question of, of the relationship between um, the elected and the unelected officials. If we move to the next slide, the second factor we identified um, was uh, the, the choice of who should head this Espace Citoyen, this, uh, this new citizen space. And here we found that actually the Espace Citoyen, uh, far from being just a sort of technical change to, to how the administrative uh, processes are managed, is really um, a new approach to managing relations with the public. And here we found that the person who was in charge of the Espace Citoyen had a very important pedagogical role in sort of guiding the public, in speaking uh, with uh, members of the public citizens to explain the procedures, to explain the documents needed, to sometimes show flexibility when citizens are confused or they don't like the change because change is often unsettling for, uh, for everybody, and to really help guide citizens through the no new processes that they needed to follow. And uh, we found uh, in, in the localities we looked at that where the head of the EC really showed the ability to engage in dialogue, to show a lot of patience, and to approach dialogue not merely as a technique uh, to achieve some uh, results, but really as a means to change the relationship between the municipality and the citizens, uh, this was uh, effective in, in um, managing uh, citizens sort of discomfort with no longer being able to go into the municipality, um, no longer being able to follow the same processes they were used to. Uh, and this really helped to, uh, to create a better relationship uh, between the Espace Citoyen and members of the public. And uh, finally, I believe the last factor we identified uh, was uh, the ability to confront conflict when it arises within institutions. Uh, and uh, we found some really interesting examples of um, localities where there had been conflict that arose uh, because introducing this new Espace Citoyen system brought about changes inevitably in the distribution of power within the municipal administration. So you have technical departments who used to be uh, in touch directly with members of the public, uh, that perhaps gave them a certain social status, uh, it gave them certain power. Um, they were now having to work in the back office, no longer seeing members of the public, uh, simply dealing with an IT program, with a computer. Um, and this, of course, generated uh, tensions and it generated conflict. So there were some localities where um, 
you know, the, the technical departments didn't want to cooperate with this new system or they refused to. Um, and we found that municipalities, which actually confronted this conflict and tried to work through it and to address it in a more, uh, uh, using various methods, were uh, more able to, to overcome this uh, conflict and to be able to uh, put in place the Espace Citoyen successfully. Um, whereas those who uh, didn't address the conflict or didn't recognize the existence of the conflict ended up having two parallel systems emerging. One official system, which was the one of the Espace Citoyen, and one unofficial system, which is the old system, which continued to work uh, and operate. Uh, and so um, it was interesting to see how municipalities and the international donor that supported the project also shifted their approach to actually recognizing the existence of conflict uh, with, when, uh, with change and integrating more elements such as uh, collective thinking workshops, conflict resolution mechanisms, really sort of trying to involve the entire municipal administration in redefining their vision of, of their relationship with the citizen, of redefining their own position within their institution, their own role. So rather than looking at the Espacitoyen as a technical solution, really there was more recognition of the, the sociological aspects of this as an organizational reform, which uh, allowed uh, the, the, the initiative to um, be able to move forward and overcome conflict. So finally, my final slide um, is what are the implications of all of this actually when we're talking about the social contract? We started with something very broad, which is the social contract in Tunisia and reimagining the social contract. And uh, we tried to really start at the local level and think about how social contracts can be uh, renegotiated, reimagined, reshaped, starting from the local level. Um, and what we found essentially was um, that, first of all, and I'll start with the last point, that in some uh, localities, it's possible to uh, cr create a sort of social covenants. And we, we borrow this uh, term from Marcus, uh, your excellent paper, um, social covenants as a sort of starting point for reimagining the social contract. What I mean here is uh, sort of agreements, settlements, understandings between local actors, local groups that enable the beginning of, of dialogue, the, in, uh, the beginning of um, new arrangements for, uh, for uh, the representation of different interests uh, and the accommodation of these different interests as a starting point for talking about the social contracts. So for example, with the community policing, you see <clears throat> Um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with the community policing project, we see uh, the security councils becoming spaces for uh, representing voices that were not represented before, uh, such as women, for example, and their views of police stations. Uh, you have uh, organizations which are beginning to enter into uh, the space of security reform. Uh, and so you have a rearranging of uh, uh, of uh, actors who are engaged in these discussions. And this could represent a starting point for developing new local social covenants, building trust between different actors on a very one-to-one -one level, on a very uh, individual level as a starting point for having more structural conversations around more systemic issues. Um, in terms of the other questions, I mean, as with all research projects, there were more questions raised than answers. Uh, we find that First of all, that the system of interest representation in Tunisia has shifted since uh, 2011. So uh, we would argue from a system of state corporatism that I just uh, described in the beginning to a sort of system of neo-corporatism with elements of pluralism. Um, and we can discuss that later as so we don't have time. Uh, but the question is really, how do you regulate this pluralism? And what we find is that you have the introduction of political pluralism into a state structure which is designed for a one-party regime. Uh, and what we find here is that while reforms have been introduced, such as, for example, access to information reforms, declarations of, of interests of public officials, at the same time, uh, the system of representation remains highly opaque and unequal. And so you have some interests being very well represented, uh, specifically those who 
were involved in the state corporatist uh, structure, uh, the Business Federation, for example, and the trade unions. But in fact, these organizations no longer represent the majority of society because the majority of society are either working in the, in the informal sector, so they're not represented by a trade union. They are, um, uh, they are working uh, in, uh, for example, in agriculture, in trade, et cetera, where they are not organized in the employers federation either. And so you have most systems for the organization of interests are no longer representative of the majority of society. So we really raise the question of how to better regulate pluralism. How do you also prevent and protect democratic institutions from being exploited and dominated by interest groups in ways that undermine those same institutions? And I think this calls for more research on the role of interest groups uh, more uh, generally in the Tunisian context. We also uh, talk about the resilience of clientelist modes of managing access to public goods. Um, we analyze how the, the Espace Citoyen project appears to be more successful in actually challenging clientelist modes of accessing public services because it seeks to standardize processes, because it seeks to disrupt um, informal circuits for submitting, for example, um, applications at the local level. And so we call for sort of uh, exploring the system more and looking at ways of building on this, uh, on this experience and seeking to learn from it uh, when looking at other public institutions that need to be reformed. Um, and finally, we also look at the question of the relationship between politicians and bureaucrats. We highlight this as an incredibly important issue when we're talking about renegotiating the social contract. We are talking also about the public administration, which plays a critical role in uh, administrating, administering the social contract. Uh, and so uh, there is a need to look more at how to actually um, restructure uh, the, the, the series of agreements between bureaucrats and politicians, whether it's talking, we're talking about terms of appointment, remuneration, rewards, uh, et cetera, to actually enable bureaucracy to do its job uh, free from political exploitation, but at the same time also allow elected officials to also uh, implement uh, their uh, platforms that they have been elected on. And so there is there has been a reconfiguration of the relationship between politicians and bureaucrats, which we explore in the report. But at the same time, there is as yet no consensus on the proper place that politics and politicians on one hand and bureaucrats should occupy within the system of government and what are their respected mandates uh, and limits. And we talk about that in relation to both projects. Uh, I'll leave it there. I'm so sorry that I've uh, taken too much time. Um, and hopefully we'll have some uh, time for discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Intisar, for sharing these very rich findings. And um, uh, yeah, uh, in a way you made up for the fact that uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Hatem Kahloun, has not uh, somehow been able to join us, even so we did email him. But uh, I think in a way it it's works out fine in terms of time because we still have uh, uh, two discussions. Also, we have to apologize for Yasmin Khodari, who we announced previously, I think, um, uh, who also couldn't make it due to uh, a scheduling clash. But we are very, very pleased to have uh, uh, Markus Lewe from the German Institute of um, Development and Sustainability, IDOS, to, and who's a real expert on this topic, um, to provide his uh, brief uh, yeah, discussion points or, or feedback. So I'll hand the floor to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody, for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Sylvia Intisar, um, and uh, nice meeting you also, Alan. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations. This is a great study. It provides a lot, a lot of very interesting and very valuable findings. Yeah, And I think, uh, uh, as far as I can see it, the methodology is, is, is really, really good. Yeah. You have really reflected well how to, to, to conduct that study. And I have rarely seen a study on, on, on development cooperation projects that re goes really so much into the details and to the different factors that play a role. And uh, so uh, congratulations, as I said. Um, uh, the report is extremely well written, and I think it contains a lot of extremely important messages and uh, messages that uh, I think a lot of institutions will will benefit from and 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 will will have to take it lesson. Of course, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have some also 
uh, thoughts on um, uh, what could have perhaps been, perhaps, I stress perhaps been done a bit differently. Yeah? So first, I had the impression that um, when I when I read your paper, your excellent paper still, I was missing a bit um, something like um, a research hypothesis from where you start or uh, also some clear assessment criteria for what you consider a good change or a valuable change in social contracts. Um, so, um, uh, of course, uh, this this would have provided a bit more transparency in the analysis, a clearer structure for the text, and an easy, also an easier understanding for readers. Um, both would have required, of course, that you base your study either on some kind of a literature review uh, on, on, on other countries with reforms in, in a similar field, or um, on, a, on, a, on a proper conceptual framework, or even better, perhaps both. Yeah. Uh, this is perhaps not the most critical point. The more critical ones will come later. Yeah? Um, without both, however, the results of the study appear to me, at least I've read it only once because there was a little bit of time, a bit some kind of almost sporadic finding, findings. And I wasn't sure if really you, you, you captured all important things and you could give enough weight, could, could really say which are important ones which are less important ones and uh, perhaps even some may have been overlooked anyhow uh, this brings me to my, my 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 third observation which is i have the impression um well of course i mean <laughs> uh, that uh, you're using the term social contract um a bit more um uh, as a as a so to say as a keyword rather than you really really using it as a lens, as a lens or even a concept of analysis, yeah? So uh, your report talks repeatedly on changes in the social contract or insufficient change in the social contract, but you hardly ever say, uh, what kind of change do you have in mind? Uh, what would be a good change? And uh, uh, what kind of change should the reforms bring about or should not bring and does it really require big reforms always to make a change in the social contract as you say at one point or doesn't uh, even um, uh, sometimes little reform change the contract uh, some at least somewhat and in an important way what kind of change would be good is every change in social contracts good and who says if a change is good and when yeah. So I mean, who 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 is who are we asking if a change is good or not? Yeah. I, I mean, and we've also been struggling for long with this. Yeah. And we were tempted very often to say ourselves, "This is a good change." Yeah. Uh, until we arrived at the point of saying, "Well, in the end, if it's a contract between partners, between agencies, they should say themselves what change they want." Yeah. And it's 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 in it's a it's an inherent thing yeah so the 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 partners in the country they should say what is good or not yeah and and not us from outside yeah um then the notion of the social contract is reduced um that was my perception not so much in the presentation but perhaps a bit a little bit in the report uh, to two state deliverables provision and participation and I think your study would benefit very much if you also refer to the state deliverable uh, protection, especially in the context of the uh, police um, uh, um, project. Yeah, uh, because I mean, in the end, the the main job of the police is to provide security. Yeah, and that's what they have in mind. Yeah, so perhaps uh, very often those uh, engaged in the police sector, they are afraid of giving up protection if they allow for more participation yeah and there's these kinds of trade-offs and i think the framework would allow for 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 really um reflecting on these kinds of real or seeming trade-offs uh, between the three p's um um so at, at, at idos we have conducted quite uh, several assessments of donor cooperation programs in the MENA region, and we found that using all three P's as categories of possible state deliverables helps very much to see how the donor programs or also national programs can be improved. So quite often we found, for example, that donor programs look very much at state provision just a state provision they improve the provision why well it's very simply yeah because national governments like to improve their provision but they sometimes 
do not want foreign donors to, to, do, to do anything related to protection participation. On the other hand, for citizens, improvements in these fields sometimes might be much more important than improvements in provision. Not always, but sometimes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, furthermore, a social contract is based, like all contracts, on the reciprocity of give and take. So you look very much at the, the gifts of the state, but I think what your findings are, are excellent for really uh, modeling the reactions of citizens to state actions to, to, to reforms as the gifts of citizens being the responses or outcomes of the takes of the citizens, which is the gifts of the state. So the gifts of citizens, as Sylvia, you said at the beginning, is the acceptance of the state and the contributions to public goods, either through tax payments or other services. So I think this, this, this relationship between give and take, I think you have it very much in your analysis. You must just um, make it, can, you can easily make it transparent. Yeah? And that would, I think, uh, uh, give uh, quite some, some, some additional uh, value. Um, then my next point is after reading the report, I asked myself, so now, I mean, in your presentation, it was much clearer, but I, in the, in the report, I asked myself, so what are actually the main messages of the report? Have the two projects been rather successful or not? And what exactly made their success a failure? And to admit, I did not find a very clear answer on these questions, but perhaps also this doesn't matter so much. And I will explain in a minute why. Uh, you say that the success of Espace Citoyen, for example, depends on three factors, and you have said it before, the commitment of mayors and the secretary general of the administration, the ability of the head of um, the Espace Citoyen, um, to build uh, a new relationship with citizens and the cooperation of the municipal staff. Uh, in a very similar way, you say that the, 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 the other project, the police project, um, the success of this local security councils is dependent on four factors, the engagement of senior officials, the willingness of key officials in the local community to engage in the project, the involvement of credible local civil society organizations, and support from higher levels in the state hierarchy. Oh, well, when, when I read this, I, I, I thought that, wow, these are quite restrictive conditions. Uh, to be fulfilled yeah uh, perhaps uh, i thought maybe tunisia can be even lucky that at least some communities fulfilled all of these conditions uh, so uh thereby making the reforms a success at least in these communities and if these are the conditions does the reform program address the key issues in governance in municipalities at all or shouldn't it rather address the conditions of success? Yeah. And this brings me to my last point, um, something that you have highlighted quite well on your very last slide in the presentation right now. Yeah. So perhaps the whole report uh, could also be organized much more around these main factors of success. So some of the factors that I read from your report, and I think this is very convincing, is conflict resolution at the local level is more important than institutional and technical reform. Well, that's that's a key message that you have in the end. Yeah, that is that is the message that 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 all partners might want to hear. Second, a different tone in the communication of the state with citizens can be more important than a reform of procedures. Another absolutely non-trivial finding, yeah? new institutions such as the local security councils need legal authority to make a change. Yeah, well, I mean, this, this may sound uh, trivial at first glance, but I mean, in the context of Tunisia, uh, this is not at all. So um, yeah, you highlight that it is much more giving it a new painting rather than re really giving it a different status. Yeah? Um, re then a democracy, transparency and accountability are difficult to achieve at the municipal level where centrally appointed officials have still a say in local affairs. Another important message, yeah, a problem, you, you point, pointed out very nicely at some point, yeah, how much there is this, uh, this trade off between the, 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 the appointed delegate from the central government who is who's seen as the state representative, yeah, while, while the elected one 
is criticized for perhaps being corrupt and so on. So, wow, this is, a, this is an interesting finding. And finally, something that uh, uh, doesn't astonish me, but I think cannot be stressed enough is a municipality's financial situation is not critical for the success of institutional reform. Wow, this was, I mean, for me, uh, a, a very important uh, finding. Nevertheless, again, congratulations, a very rich report. Thank you very much for your kind words. Really appreciate it. And all these really insightful comments, which uh, we take on board. We don't, I think, have the space to answer them. Uh, I mean, I think there was some notion about, you know, when you asked about success, I mean, just briefly, I think what came to mind is sort of variation in success, right? So we cannot say that the project as a whole has been successful or not, but, you know, it has been successful in certain places. And then we want to find out what are these contextual conditions that enable, you know, some successes. And and, and I guess then the policy implication is, you know, whether these conditions can be brought about uh, intentionally through an intervention or not so but yeah I mean that's first my initial reaction and um, I think we'll yeah everything is really much appreciated all your comments and I want to highlight to the participants that this is a draft report which we've only shared so far with Marcus and Ellen and uh, we are uh, going to incorporate these comments and then with your permission we might uh, use the sign up uh, registration for the webinar to send it to all of you who, who are participating and if you want to opt out of course um, that's also fine uh, but then um, uh, you have a, maybe a, a chance to see the final report hopefully in a, in a few weeks time um yeah so let's uh, let's go to ellen uh, so that we do have a little bit of time also for the participants thank you Thank you. So again, um, thank you for for inviting me to read this. I really, really appreciated the chance to um, to yeah get a much deeper understanding of the of the study. And I, like Marcus, really commend you on a great job. Um, I also am going to sort of pick up a little bit where Marcus left off because he picked up on the sort of the fact that you know your socioeconomic sort of status, the socioeconomic conditions of the of the. Um, communities doesn't seem to be a driving factor, and I also want to to sort of lift that up. I think it's a really interesting. It's both a. It's both great that that's how you designed the study to be able to look at that, but it's also, um, I think, it's a really interesting finding. Um, I thought that there were two other things that um, sort of I want to focus a little bit on the comparison between the police reform and the municipal studies because I think that that you don't do quite as much as you could with really thinking about how those two come together. You do a very nice job situating why this comparison, why they're similar in terms of the sort of the elements of the programs, if you will. Um, but then I think there's also some interesting kind of similarities and differences in terms of the of the outcomes and findings you have that can that can get a little bit more attention. Um, of course, for both of them, really what you seem to be pointing to, if we want to abstract away a little bit from whether it's civil society or upper higher level administrations, for both of them, you seem to be really pointing to sort of the need for both key actors and organizational support, right? So, you know, it's not just do you have a a municipal leader, but it's also do they sort of or a, or a police a police chief, but also do they have support from those who are are higher up? It's not just do you have a sort of a, a local sort of elite or leader um, who can help to champion, but do they have a strong civil society organizations that they can work with? So this combination of agency and individual sort of leadership on the one hand, and a sort of organizational capacity strength and, and bureaucratic support on the other, I think is very, very interesting. It might be one way to think about how these, you know, kind of findings fit together a little bit more. The other thing I thought was really interesting was this, this sort of that in some ways you also showed, pointed to fragility, which made me sort of wonder, is this, really a, is this really a social contract being rewritten if things can go backsliding so very quickly? For, you know, the sort of most obvious case of that or example of that was in the, in the sort of the police reform project, right? But just generally, you know, how do we think about social contract as being something that gives kind of more teeth and a longer standing? And you're not necessarily saying it's been achieved, but but how would we sort of how would we know when it seems to be changing, right? Um, now, of course, one one of the big differences between these programs is that within the police reform project, the civil society plays a very key role, right? It's a sort of a a partner in co-production, if you will. 
whereas in the in the sort of the espesion it's actually more of a of a recipient right so the you know it was really the back office and the front office and of how they interface with the with the public is is how it's presented that may be also be how the the project is designed but i couldn't help but wonder if it wasn't also the case that in you know sort of the expectations that individuals come to at the office with also make a difference right are there ways in which you know whether or not something you know, whether or not they are a, an, you know, an explicit partner in the project, are they nevertheless important in sort of affecting how successful it is or what happens? Um, I wanted to see a little bit more attention being paid to transparency. Again, I thought that that was something that was particularly important in the in the sort of municipal project more so than in the police report reform in a sense. So, so um, but I wanted to hear a little bit more about how that mattered because, again, in those sort of backsliding cases, it seemed to be the the fear that there wasn't really transparency, right? That helps to undermine the success of these projects. So, you know, is something that you you might think about is you know, the extent to which transparency is really achieved, how important is that for, you know, renegotiating social contracts. Um, I also wanted to hear a little bit about what you sort of ended on in Tisar, which was this question about, you know, how can you sort of, in a sense, it was the way I heard it at least was, you know, how can you incentivize, you know, sort of individuals to actually sort of stay in without sort of disrupting and, 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 um, uh, undermining actually sort of the sort of whole senses of transparency and and what you're trying to achieve right in sort of the bureaucracy but I would like to see a little bit more thinking about and, and it, this again sort of I think dovetails nicely with Marcus what you're saying about you know how do you try to create the conditions that would lead to success right because that's one way of thinking about about what I'm you know what I'm also wondering about um, I also thought that there you could even do a little bit more with sort of almost thinking about the sort of the differences in these in these communities that might have explained why we get you know sort of uh, you know leaders or civil society that can come to support in one case and not in another case right so you know how to put it sort of in one way, how much is this about selection and how should we think about that? But but again, it gets really back to, I think, what this really important point of how do we think about where those conditions exist and to what extent can those be part of program design or, or how much can they be, how much can they be um, sort of supported? One other thing I think that you might pay a little bit more attention to is uh, sort of the potential for increased frustration right so you sort of nod a little bit to this but especially with the police reform and it reminded me of a study that was done in India where the idea of having people be able to kind of bring bring grievances and sort of have more of an ombuds sort of um, engagement you know made made it first people sort of had increased sort of um, um, support and trust for the institutions and then they realized that nothing was really changing and so then they became actually less trusting of the institutions so so you know sort of raising expectations and then whether or not they're actually met um, and it was interesting that in your in the sort of the what was happening was that the way that they were actually at least in some cases struggling to meet them was by actually circumventing the actual legal restrictions, right? This quote that you have, which is beautiful. It's like, you know, we know they didn't come with the right papers, but if we wait, you know, we, you know, force them to go back and get the right papers, then what have we done, right? So, so that tension between sort of the, you know, kind of the, the sort of administrative rules, right? And this need to be able to kind of build the, build the trust. But what happens if rather the administrative rules are taken more seriously, and what you do is have, you know, yes, the transparency and everything else, but you, but what you get is a lot of people being turned away. So I just think it's worth thinking about, you know, what are the potential at least, uh, you know, kind of downsides or, you know, are there times when these reforms are not only not successful in terms of not, not improving things, but right actually in some cases may be, um, you know, may undermine trust and undermine a, a social contract, if you will. Um, and the final thing, again, I, I actually thought there was um, 
to some extent, and this gets back, Marcus, I'm, all I'm doing is basically repeating everything you've said, but basically, you know, it gets back to this question about understanding kind of these key factors because, you know, if you're thinking about something like scaling up, and that's often, you know, kind of something people want to sort of know is how much can, can pro, you know, programs be scaled up. I mean, you sort of suggest in some ways, just because the Sedouin project is actually already has a lot of demand for it, right, that at least in terms of uptake, it's scale upable, but it was also very flexible. So how much is that, you know, is that scalable in that sense, or is it that we want to sort of improve infrastructure? And that, you know, it's a, a, that's a very cynical way of thinking about it, but it is a, it is a question. And then, you know, the, the sort of the second part is, okay, with something like the police reform or with other projects, right, how do we think about, you know, getting to scale if part of the part of the sort of the determinants of success and failure are conditions that may not be, at least at the moment, programmed in or, or taken into account in terms of, of the sort of programming in the, you know, kind of de uh, the design itself. And, you know, and how far can scale up go if you don't try to address those project those problems. So I'll leave it at that. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave it at 5.30 exactly, 5.30 my time. Um, Ah. Are you okay? Yeah. We yes, I'm you. fine. I just it, I just lost everything. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you just. So anyway, I just want to say uh, thank you. I think it was great to get a chance to read this. That's thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for your valuable uh, comments. Uh, I don't know, Auntie Sarah, you want to briefly respond, uh, or do, should we use the nine minutes for the Q and A? And people can also write in the chat, please, if you have any questions. Or yeah, of course, uh, we and and um, yeah, Auntie Sarah, do you want to briefly re react or? Uh, yeah, it depends if we have if we have any questions. Let's give that priority. But... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we can maybe stop recording then so that people feel comfortable uh, if they want to switch on the video.